just a poor wayfaring stranger traveling in this world of woe. Colossians chapter 1, 
verses 3 to 14. I'm going to be reading from uh, the ESV. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. Pray with me. Lord God, would you open our eyes and open our ears uh, to see and hear from you this morning. Uh, by your Spirit, would you do that? Jesus, would you be the uh, good and chief shepherd this morning? Would you speak through me? Would you give me ears to hear and eyes to see? Lord, would the, everything that I say be from you? Whatever is from me or whatever is not worth saying, may I not say it, may I not remember it, but if I do say it, Lord, would it fall in deaf ears? But what is from you, Lord, would it echo in our hearts? Would it remind us of you and what you have done for us? We love you, Jesus, and we pray these things in your name. We live uh, in a sad world, as was mentioned earlier. The, uh, this week, as I was preparing uh, for this message, at, um, it was a third, I think it was Thursday morning, I was checking Facebook and uh, saw on Facebook status where a friend of ours, actually from Savannah, someone that Margaret grew up with, uh, I think 29, 30 years old, mother of three, her husband died in a car accident, or a motorcycle accident, left her with three children under the age of six. Or uh, I remember the morning uh, when I was in high school and got the phone call. I was planning to go to an amusement park the next day with my friends and found out that a childhood friend of mine, same age as me, had, been, had died. And the family was asking me to go and be the pallbearer for a 17-year-old at his funeral. Or maybe for some of us it is uh, going to the hospital or going to that um, appointment uh, for uh, what we think is a, a routine daily checkup and hearing words like cancer or uh, expecting to see a heartbeat on the ultrasound and there is none. <clears throat> or for some of us, it's thinking, certainly by now, my relationship with X will be fine. Certainly we won't have this resentment. Certainly we won't have this continued hostility and it is still icy cold. <clears throat> Or certainly now I will get over the pain and the hurt of what happened in the past, and it is still wrong. Friends, I don't have to tell you that we live in a sad world, and that our lives bear the scars of that sadness. If we had time, we could go through this room and tell story upon story upon story of the sadness that you have seen, that I have seen. And despair and sadness... If you've experienced it, 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 it's like an invasion. It robs you of your joy. That even when uh, the best days come, that moments can steal every bit of joy. Just that one thought. And so it is in this situation, in this sad world, in this darkness, that Paul writes this letter to this church, this small gathering of Christians. And he says, we always thank God. And so we ask, okay, what, what is our state? What is the answer to the sadness that we see and that we feel day in and day out? And Paul says that it's to give thanks. And so we need to ask that question. I, I mentioned earlier that this semester we're going to be asking this question uh, in the book of Colossians. Is Jesus enough? And so even for this morning, the question could be, is Jesus enough to give thanks in a sad world? And so there, you're, uh, there's an outline in front of you. There's two basic parts. Why is Paul thankful? 
And then uh, what is the result? So why, first, why is Paul thankful? And he's thankful, to put it simply, because God is at work. Where do I see that? Well, there's uh, two ways that I see this, that God is at work in the world and he's at work in the Colossians. So where do we see that he's at work in the world? Look at uh, verses 12 to 14. This is sort of the, what is God doing for us? Uh, Paul uses that first person plural for us. What is he doing for us? And we see that um, there's two actions that Paul talks about. And it's important to note that they are both in the past tense. More, more about that later. But first that he has delivered us. This dramatic rescue has happened. That there was imminent danger. And so we have been rescued. We have been delivered from danger, from darkness. That's what Paul is saying, that there has been a dramatic rescue that has happened, and we are on the receiving end of that. But it's not just deliverance. You notice that the other word is he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us. Transferred this, this sense of completeness. Remember we said it's in the past. And so Paul's not saying, hopefully, maybe one day, someday, we'll be delivered and we'll change status. It is that this has happened. You've been transferred. You have left somewhere and gone somewhere else. You had one status, and now you have another. You were in darkness, and now you're in light. And so then we ask, where have we been transferred? You know, <laughs> sometimes we hear that word transferred it kind of has bad connotations because we think of job transfers, moving me from somewhere to somewhere I don't want to go or something like that. Or maybe sometimes, sometimes that's good. You know, you want to go somewhere, you want to leave where you are. But where have we been transferred? Is it better than the domain of darkness? And we see that Paul says that you've been transferred, we have been transferred <coughs> to the kingdom of his beloved son. That word kingdom is huge. Paul doesn't use that word much. Jesus uses it a lot. If you read the Gospels, he talks about the kingdom of God a lot. Paul doesn't talk about it as much. And so when he does talk about it, it's significant. So why does that, Paul says, he says the kingdom of his beloved son. Why would he say that? He's talking about Jesus. And if you have read through the Gospels, that phrase, beloved son, reminds us of a time in Jesus' life, his baptism. When Jesus is baptized, he comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Which also reminds us, if you've read the Old Testament, there is a psalm, Psalm 2, that talks about the king. When the king is, uh, ascends to the throne, he takes his rightful place. This psalm is read, and he, the king is referred to as the Son, the Son of God. He is the representative of God's people. And so when Paul says the kingdom of his beloved son, what he is saying is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the heir to the throne of David. He is the king. And the king has come. And just like any king, he conquers his enemies. And he conquers the enemies of sin and death and despair and sadness. This is our champion. This is our rescuer. This is our deliverer. We said we needed deliverance. We were in darkness. And yet we cannot do it ourselves. But yet one has come. This champion. This hero that strides onto the field of battle. And fights the battles that you and I would never win. And so we think. Well, before I move on. He is the one. Isaiah says that. He was a man of sorrows, the one, the king, who should always know joy, should always know gladness, is the one who meets suffering and sadness and despair at the cross so that his people might know joy. And so that's God's work in the world. But what about God's work in the Colossians? We said that the last uh, section we could really say it's for us, but now Paul says for you. There's a section where we talk about for you where he mentions the Colossians. And so what does he say about the Colossians? Well, uh, verse 4, he says that they talk, he's heard of the love you have for all the saints. So that their relationships now, maybe once they were marked with bitterness, strife, jealousy, one-upmanship, are now characterized by love. That once where there was despair and sadness, verse 5, the hope laid up for you, where? In heaven. 
a place that is untouched by the troubles and the sadness of the world that we live in, that's where our hope is. And so then we rightly ask, especially in our day and age, okay, that sounds great, but we've all heard the telemarketers spin, right? You know, they're like, you're going to get 20% interest, or 20% return on your investment, guaranteed. And we all have this inner cynic that goes, really? <laughs> I've heard this before. And so how can we be sure? That's where verse 12 comes in. Did you notice that he, the Father, has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light? That word inheritance is huge. It reminds us of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there was the land given to God's people. And you knew you belonged to God's people because you had a plot of land that you were given by God. And it was sort of the, I belong to God's people because I belong, I have this inheritance in the land where God dwells. And now Paul says to Gentiles, remember, most of us in this room are probably Gentiles. So we would be landless, if you will, in the Old Testament. And he says, now you have an inheritance. We have an inheritance. How in the world can that be sure? Because the Father has qualified you. How in the world is that possible? It is the result of the gospel, friends. This gospel that he says has borne fruit and is growing all over the entire world, which it still is doing today, is the reason why we have that, because our faith is in Jesus. As verse 4 says, our faith is in Jesus our champion, our deliverer, our king. Friends, God is at work. And Paul is thankful for that. And so then we need to ask, okay, well, how does this make us thankful? Because that does not change the world that you and I live in. It is still a sad world. And friends, I, as I, I thought about this, despair and sadness, one of the most common characteristics of despair, sadness, is that it wants us to bury our head in our situation. And so if you are sad, if you are despair, maybe, maybe that's you today. It, you, you want to, to sort of laser focus on the problem. And, you, and despair wants you to keep your focus and your gaze there and not elsewhere. It wants to make your happiness and your thanksgiving conditional on your experiences. But we need to remember, it, we find out later in Colossians that Paul is not writing this letter from uh, the Cayman Islands or from some resort in the Mediterranean. He's writing it from prison. And so what in the world, how can Paul give thanks from prison cell? And that's where there has to be something beyond his experiences that is so overwhelmingly beautiful, so overwhelmingly great, that he is able to look beyond his experiences and give thanks. I've been, I've been reading through um, The Lord of the Rings uh, recently, and there's a part in the, uh, in the books where, um, I'm not familiar with the stories, but uh, basically there, uh, there are these two hobbits who are traveling down this road to destroy the ring of fire. I know that there's a lot more of that story, and you've probably seen the movie, so just, you know, we don't have time. But anyways, um, they come to almost the end of their journey, and as they're coming to this land that they must travel across, it is literally called the Dying Lands. It is marked with ash and nothing grows there. It is dark. And it is, there's barely anything to eat or drink. They are inching their way along. There's clouds that hide the sun. And so it's a land literally filled with darkness. And yet, there's this beautiful moment where um, Tolkien writes this. Um, the land seemed full of creaking and cracking and sliding voices. There's no sound of voice or foot. But far above, in the night sky, there was still dim and pale. They are keeping among the cloud rack above a dark tower. High up in the mountain, Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while, the beauty that smote his heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land. And hope returned to him. For like a shaft clear and cold, the thought pierced him that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond its that's a picture of essentially what Paul is doing. Where his experiences have not changed, and yet he's able to look beyond his experiences and say there is light and beauty and gladness because of what the Father has done. And that, because of that, we can give 
thanks. And so I ask you, where, wherever you are this morning, what are you fixing your eyes on? And what are you tempted? What, te what, what are you tempted that, that to say, well, if everything would be great if I had that, or I could give thanks if I simply had that, or if this wasn't there, or if that person would stop talking to me, or start talking to me, if I had that relationship, if I didn't have that relationship, whatever it is for you, what are you tempted to look at and fix your eyes on and say, if I had that, everything would be okay? Because what this passage is saying is to lift our eyes, not to fix them on our experiences, but to fix them on Jesus. Because Paul grounds our thanksgiving in what God has done. Thanksgiving, in a sense, is drawing on the past resources of God's mighty acts in history and bringing them into our present experiences so that we will look to the future and transform it with hope. It does not, friends, hear me. Christianity does not come to you and say, everything's going to be fine now. You won't have sadness. No, friends, our lives are marked with sadness. The Bible nowhere says that. But what the Bible does say is that there is a hope and what, because of what God has done in time and space in Jesus that can enable us to look at our sadness and despair and not be defined by it. Because one day, someday, all of our sadness will be gone. Because our inheritance is in heaven. And in heaven, there is no sadness or despair. And one day, that will be ours. And so then, okay, if that's why Paul's thankful, what's the result? You know, that you would think with that kind of news, it should change the way we live our lives. And that just makes sense. And so what is the result? What happens when we live this life? And that's where he prays. I don't know if you notice that, but verses 9 11, he has this prayer in the middle of the, the Thanksgiving sandwich, if you will. And so what, what is he praying for? He prays that the Colossians would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that he wants them to have this knowledge that changes the way they live their lives. Like for me, when I was in high school, I grew up uh, playing football in high school. And um, there are times in practice, if any of you uh, played football or watch football, if, if you know the play ahead of time, it changes the way that you, you know, play, especially if you're on defense. So there would be times I'm playing defense, and we'd hear what the offense is going to do, the play they're going to run. And they would sort of say, okay, we'll just pretend you didn't hear that. Which is silly, because if you're on defense, you know, okay, if I know the ball is going here, why would I run over here? I, it's going here, you know? And so this knowledge changes the way that I lived in that moment, in that play. And Paul is saying, in a sense, that this knowledge of what God has done changes the way we live our lives. And so what kind of life does he describe? And it's in verse 10, the worthy life, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And so then we ask, okay, well, what does that mean? What does worthy mean? And, and maybe even for some of us, our defenses go up. Say, like, wait a second. I have to. I, I knew that there was a catch. I knew there was a bait and switch. God says, yeah, you can have my love, but you got to do something for me in return. That's kind of what we expected at some point. And so is that what Paul is actually saying? I don't think it is. And so why, why do I say that? There's four participles in Greek that sort of say, okay, there is this worthy life, but how is the worthy life to be lived? Well, the first one is um, in verse 10. It's bearing fruit in every good work. This idea of bearing fruit is all over the Bible. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains in me will bear much fruit. Or even in Psalm 1, that there is the man who walks, uh, or woman even for that matter, who walks in the way of the Lord. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that bears its fruit. This idea of fruit, it brings a blessing to others. And what, so we ask, what is the fruit? What does the, uh, the New Testament even say about fruit? Well, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, on and on we can go. That that is the life that Paul is saying will continually characterize the Christian. But he also says that we're not only bearing fruit, but that we're growing or increasing in the knowledge of God. That same phrase was used in, in verse, uh, verse 6 where he describes the gospel. And now he's saying that same gospel that's doing this all over the world is doing this among you. And we pray that it would continue uh, to do so. And growing, it's interesting, it's a passive verb. So Paul's not saying, okay, now go and grow yourselves. It's, kind of, it's, it's about the same as if you looked at your plants in your garden and say, all right, start growing. You know, it's, it is something that God gives the growth. 
And so it's not like that, but uh, again, there's this passive idea in verse 11 with the next participle. It's to be strengthened. Paul doesn't say, make yourself strong. He says to be strengthened. When it, these two words, because they're in the passive, commentators say that it's this idea of divine passive. Because the agent, the one who's driving the action, is God. And so that is huge, friends, because Paul is saying, look, you live in a sad world. We live in a sad world, and you will need strength to endure. You will need, it takes strength to have joy. And so what kind of power is Paul talking about? It's the power that speaks worlds into existence. It's the power that sustains everything merely by uh, continuing to think about it. That God sustains all things, that Jesus sustains all things by the word of his power. And Paul's saying that you should, you and I, to be strengthened in that power. And so it's no wonder that the last part of simple is giving thanks. It's this, because of um, what God has done in the past, this is the life that we are to live, which then leads to more thanksgiving. Because, friends, the, the amazing thing about it is this thanksgiving leads to uh, a worthy life. Because the worthy life is from God. What God requires, he gives. In Ephesians 4, he has the same idea, to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Paul is not saying, go out and live up to the ideals that God has saved you, and you know maybe you can be good enough for his love. He says, God has loved you, he has saved you, he has delivered you. And so this is what the worthy life looks like in his strength and his power, which then leads to more thanksgiving. <laughs> I can't do that. And yet God has done it. Friends, God is at work, but God's work makes us worthy. And so how does this meet our sadness and despair? Well, if you've ever had this uh, despair, there's sort of the despair of the impossible. For students, it's this idea of a syllabus day. I don't know if you've ever remember those days. Some of you, that's a lot sooner than others, or you have children or grandchildren who've been there. Uh, syllabus day is this day where you go in and you know your teacher gives you the syllabus. All the books you're going to read, all the things you're going to do, everything. And Sometimes, if you're like me, you kind of look at that and you go, there is no way this is going to get done in the next 12 weeks or whatever. I mean, this is crazy talk. <laughs> and this sort of this despair of the impossible, like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do all this. And it can be depressing. And Because, friends, we want the worthy life. We, I mean, who doesn't want to hear those words, that, that, that your life has been worthy and has been worthwhile? But it feels impossible, and so we try to do it we try to build our resume through relationships, through friends, through job experiences, through what we have done, to sort of hold it up and say, see, my life has been worthy. Look at my accomplishments. Even this morning, we were talking with some students um, from Purdue, and just sort of this idea of Purdue uh, just forces the, the, the question is, is, it, is Jesus enough, but is academics enough? Is the good grade enough? And Purdue would say, yes, that's all you need. But the problem comes when you make the seat. Or when you walk into the room, and all of a sudden, when you were the valedictorian of your class, you're not the smartest person in the room anymore. Or when you get the phone call from your boss thinking you're going to get the promotion, and instead you get a pay cut. You know that experience. And it's, it kills us because we instinctively think my life is worthy because of this. Because of how my children have turned out. Because of what's in the bank account. Whatever it might be. And Paul says that Thanksgiving breaks that cycle. And it breaks that cycle by reminding you and I of what God has done. Paul reminds us of God's work that he has made us worthy. Not in your good works. Not in uh, how you feel at any given moment. But in Jesus. The Father has qualified to share the inheritance of the saints in life. And because of that, friends, it leads us to pray and to love others more, and to love God more. What God requires, he gives. God's work makes us worthy, which leads to more praise. Friends, we are his children, and he has made us his children, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done, what his son has done. And that is good. Because we need to remind ourselves of that all the time. I need to be reminded of that all the time. Because if we don't have that, we sort of give thanks because we have to. Remember the, the forced Thanksgiving? Thanks, God, for giving me a daily bread. Amen. You know,
You know, it's, it's sort of that. But Paul says, no, our thanksgiving, our, our lives should be transformed with this thanksgiving from the heart because we have been made his own. We have a place of belonging in the sun. There's a movie, uh, Blood Diamond, I'm not necessarily uh, recommending it, uh, but there's a, a scene in the movie. It, it tracks this family uh, in Africa. And uh, the, the son, the young son, probably 10 years old, was kidnapped by these rebel forces and brainwashed. And he was taught to kill. Uh, and so he lives uh, for, for months in this rebel camp, and his father is searching for him, as any good father would, heartbroken over the loss of his son. And so there's this moment where he finds him. He finds his son, rescues him, they get out. And as soon as they leave this rebel camp, there's this huge moment where they're um, just sort of recouping, gathering their stuff, and his son sees a loaded gun, stoops up, picks up the gun, and points it. And you can see the expression on his father's face because he points it at his father's friend, and he this interchange starts as, Dio, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? You're my son. And so then he begins and then points the, the gun at his own father. And as any, I mean, it is just a nightmare for any parent. And so he begins speaking to his son and says, you know, you are uh, Dia Mende of the proud Mende tribe. You are my son. I know that they made you do bad things, but you are not a bad boy. I am your father who loves you. You will come home with me and be my son again. Friends, there is no other way. I mean, there's no, almost no other example that can top that of sadness. The fact that we live in a sad world. And yet just as Dia's father reminded him of his true identity, what is true, and that broke the cycle of violence in his life. Friends, we need to be reminded of what our God has done. That we have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus. That he has qualified us. That he is at work. In this world, even as we speak, drawing all men and women to himself, drawing them from every tribe, nation, tongue, language, all over the world, will come and bow the knee before him. That he, the Father, has rescued us. That he reminds us over and over again that you are my son, you are my daughter, not because of what you have done, not because of your efforts or your good works, but because of Jesus. And through faith in Him. Friends, it is easy for you to, for you not to bury our heads in the sand and to, into our situation and go, God, if you fix this, I'll give you thanks. But if you don't, I won't. But Paul reminds us that there is ultimate beauty, there is ultimate hope in this world, and that it's personal. And it's found in Jesus that what He started, He will finish. This question echoes through, uh, actually, the Lord of the Rings. At the end of the novel, there's the one of the characters asks this question, will all the sad things come true? Friends, that, that question echoes through every single one of our hearts, and through every page of the Bible, will all the sad things one day, someday come true? And the answer is yes and amen in Jesus. So give thanks, Christian, for what he has done for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have qualified us. That, Lord, we know ourselves Sometimes we don't know ourselves well enough that we on our own are not qualified, that the resumes we build are insufficient, that, or they would be stamped across our checking account, insufficient funds. And when you have qualified us in Jesus, and we have forgiveness, we have redemption, what we long for.